things. I'd just like to say hello to everyone who's come here. I'd also like to express my gratitude to uh, the Muslim Students Association for um, for organizing this event. I think it take, took a fair bit of initiative and actually some courage. But given the fact that this is one of the most pressing issues before Canadians today, I think it's very important that uh, we have open forums and teachings like this, and I would hope that, uh, that this is the first of others to come. Um, I guess my views on this, and I've really come, in a sense, to share some ideas fairly briefly, but also to learn from other people's ideas. Um, I think my, in a sense, my main view about this is that Canadians are, right now, are, in a sense, being tried to be sold a bill of goods by the government, and I don't think most Canadians are buying it. I remember that uh, last March I went to a meeting in the Lower Society, and uh, it was actually a meeting for the Canadian ambassador to Afghanistan, whose name was David Sproul, to explain the government's position and to justify the invasion and occupation of the country. And there was a lot of questions that were asked at the time, and I have some interest in occupations because for several years before I came to Canada, I had the dubious privilege of living under the British occupation of Northern Ireland. So that was a fairly local event by comparison to other occupations today. But we learned some very important lessons from that experience, and I think some of them are equally transferable to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Palestine, and other areas. So when I finally managed to get a question to David Sproul, I got up onto my two hind feet. And I said, Mr. Ambassador, I said, I wonder if he could answer me one question. And he said, yes. And he already, from my vibes, was getting some feelings that this, this was not going to be good. I said, would it be possible for you to explain to me why it is that Canadian soldiers are being sent so gleefully to Afghanistan when, when they were really needed in Rwanda? And General Romeo Dallaire was pleading through the United Nations and the Canadian government to get troops in Rwanda to prevent the oncoming genocide that he saw very clearly. Why is it that we're sending them so quickly to Afghanistan and we didn't send them to Rwanda? And you could hear the pin drop when I asked the question. And then he gave me the answer, which I, I kind of expected, and, and has reverberated in my ears ever since from every government spokesman who says the same thing. He said, our first commitment in Afghanistan, he says, was to maintain our relationships with our allies and to contribute to the war on terror, the global war on terror. And he didn't allow me a follow-up question, and my chance was gone. But of course, I sat back in my chair and I thought, the war on terror. And I thought, how many other people have been labeled as terrorists, even in my short life, uh, who have gone on? <laughs> to, in various ways, become representatives of their countries and often important statesmen. Jo Jomo Kenyatta was a Mau Mau terrorist in Kenya. Maybe you're too young to remember that. But uh, people like uh, Martin McGuinness uh, and Jerry Adams from my country were terrorists, according to the, the British government. They're now sitting in the Westminster House of Commons, for the love of God. In other words, we found in the past that labeling people as terrorists is simply a way of dehumanizing them, of not dealing with them, of simply finding military solutions to them. Geronimo was a terrorist. Big Bear and Sitting Bull were all terrorists as well. So it occurred to me very quickly that we call terrorists those people that we need to dehumanize, and often for reasons that we are taking their land, that we're occupying their country, uh, that we are performing some other kind of colonial activity. And so, to go back to what I was saying, it's my feeling that the Canadians, the government is trying to sell us a bill of goods, and I don't think that we're actually buying it. But this raises very serious questions, and it raises the question of the nature of our citizenship, the nature of our democracy. Because for me, Democracy doesn't mean the right every four years to elect a new government. We, we live at a stage in history, maybe it's after 9-11, maybe, maybe it came before that, 
that we need, in a sense, to take much greater accountability for what our governments do. And electing a government does not give them a license to open up a campaign of invasion and occupation. It does not give them a license necessarily to kill, particularly when the majority of your population are not consenting to that. And if you go back to the 2003, in the spring, just before the occupation and invasion of Iraq, it's estimated that over 40 million people demonstrated, particularly in Europe, on the streets of London, of Paris, Rome, Vienna, Hamburg, but also in Cairo, and in, in Amman, and in the Middle East and countries as well. 40 million people said, we do not want the war that Bush is promising to give us. What happened? The war went ahead anyway. It was clear that the majority of the population were committed to peaceful alternatives, that they did not buy the arguments of weapons of mass destruction or connection to 9-11, and still the war went ahead. And the problem for us is how do we put the brakes on a government that is prepared to license killing in our name without our consent? How do we deepen the nature of our democracy? Uh, and how do we, in a sense, deepen the nature of our citizenship at a time when our citizenship is being weakened in many different ways? Examples in the United States are legion. What do I mean by weakening of citizenship? I mean the government has a right now in the, in the US, although we're not here yet, to know what library books I checked out in the last six years. It has a right to, to eavesdrop without getting a warrant. And in this country, of course, security certificates give this government the right to pick up landed immigrants and detain them without trial, just as the British Army did in Northern Ireland. And that didn't solve any problems whatsoever. It contributed to the mess. So what does the war in Afghanistan mean here to Canadians? And I am a Canadian, after all, a Canadian by choice rather than birth. But it means, in a sense, that we have to reevaluate what we mean by citizenship, what we mean by democracy. Citizenship in the new world means being a global citizen, not just a Canadian citizen. It means taking responsibility for what our government does overseas. Why are we opposed to Afghanistan? The war? There's many reasons. I mean, one of the reasons is the Canadian Army right now is mixing with the British and American armies who are using unlawful weapons. They're using depleted uh, uranium shells. They're using hydro rockets with tungsten darts. Those are bad. The British Army has just started to use it. The Canadian Army in 2002 said to the, the American occupation forces in Afghanistan, no, we cannot use landmines because we are bound by the 1997 Ottawa Landmines Convention. So what happened? The American army said, it's okay. We'll put them out for you. You'll still be protected by them. Landmines have been used many times in Canadian forces bases and not always by American use. Some of them are left over from the Soviet war, but they still serve the purpose. White phosphorus has been used in Afghanistan. It's like napalm. And although technically speaking it can be used for incendiary purposes, it's not supposed to be used on, on the battlefield or certainly against civilian populations. And the evidence from Sendless Report and Human Rights Watch is indeed that it has been used. What about the transfer of political prisoners? Uh, of, of prisoners of war. Under the Third Geneva Convention, it says battlefield pr prisoners of war have to be subjected to, a, uh, to a, a tribunal which determines whether they are prisoners of war, and if they are, then they should be treated with the full Geneva Accords. What's the American answer to that? We don't recognize prisoners of war in Afghanistan or Iraq. They are illegal combatants. And somebody asked the Canadian ambassador in Afghanistan about this question. And his reply was, oh, that's OK. We just signed a 2005 agreement with the Afghan government, which says we only transfer prisoners of war to the legal sovereign government of Afghanistan. But the Geneva Convention says that we, as Canadians, are still committing war crimes if we knowingly pass over prisoners of war to Afghanistan 
and with the full expectation that they will pass over to American authorities if they so desire, which is happening all the time. So we, in a sense, are caught by our own bootstraps here. We are, in a sense, committing war crimes. We have the possibility to be charged in various ways because we are complicit with the United States and with the British authorities who have tortured, abused, executed prisoners on the battlefield and, of course, uh, have sometimes inadvertently um, bombed civilian populations as well. So why are we also against the war in Afghanistan? Because not only are we committing possibly war crimes, we are actively engaged with armies that are using unlawful weapons, but we are contributing to massive poverty and starvation. And Momad re referred to the Senate's report, and the Senate's report documents the degree to which the rural economy in Afghanistan has been pulverized by, not just by this war, but by the, the war against the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union had three divisions in Afghanistan. It's over 100,000 men. And the Americans have got what? About 20, 22,000. No more than that. And they, they really expect some kind of fruitful outcome out of this. So there are many reasons. The, the devastation of the rural economy. We in Canadian forces are also acting to enforce American drug policy. They're engaged in crop eradication programs of the poppy. Well, how many of us realize that in Turkey, for example, several years ago, and in Thailand, the national governments came to an agreement with poppy farmers that they would license the production of poppies, the growing of poppies, and they would monopolize the marketing of it for the use of analgesics and anesthetic properties. They were used for opiate-based codeines. And, and other pain-killing drugs. This is done in Thailand, in Laos, and most recently in Turkey. And although the American government at one time saw Turkey as the number one source of heroin it now, and opium, and it now sees that, of course, as Afghanistan, the American government finally came to an agreement with the Turkish government to approve the licensing of poppy production. And it still maintains that agreement with its drug, uh, with its drug administration. But in Afghanistan, Canadian troops are, are used simply to enforce American drug policy um, and, in a sense, contribute to the degree of rural poverty and starvation in those areas. So I guess in conclusion, I just basically like to make the point that this is a, a kind of historic moment in, the, in Canadian foreign relations. And it's an opportunity for all of us to think through what the ideals of global citizenship and deep democracy actually mean. And amongst other things, I would suggest to you that they should mean certain commitments that we all have, that we insist that, that our governments take seriously. One commitment could be the end of the use of military force to solve political problems. The only justification for military force that I, I would probably, for the most part, count this is directly in self-defense. And as Professor Qureshi said, Afghanistan never attacked the United States. In fact, none of the 9-11 hijackers were Afghans. A lot of them came from Saudi Arabia. Why was Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan? Because he was a war hero. He was, he was wounded three or four times fighting the Soviet Union. And the Afghan government after a period of time, negotiated or tried to negotiate with the United States, saying, well, if the Americans wanted to put Osama bin Laden on trial, Afghanistan would agree to transfer him to an international tribunal, but not to give him over to the United States. The Americans didn't even bother to negotiate. So the first, I think, ideal of a new citizenship is to commit ourselves and force our governments, one way or another, to commit to the idea of an end to the use of military force for solving political problems. And a second important consideration I would give is the need for us to uphold international law, not to use banned weapons, to treat people according 
to our international treaty obligations, whether it's the Geneva Convention, whether it's the Convention on Torture, whether it's the Ottawa Convention on Landmines, whether it's environmental treaties that we've signed, like the Kyoto Protocol. These are not signed for fun. They are serious undertakings, and any government which wants to be taken seriously has to live up to its international obligations. So I would say this is an opportunity for us to think through what we want to be as a country and the contribution that we want to make internationally.